a voice. The headline, UNN hosts former Minister of Information and Communications. Enugu State Governorship aspirant and former Minister of Information, Mr. Frank Mweke, holds a distinguished lecture in the University of Nigeria in Suka campus. The lecture we theme, Reclaiming Our Identity, Politics and Developments in Igbo Land, held in the Princess Alexandra Auditorium in the University of Nigeria and Sukkar on 19 January 2023, with respected scholars and students in attendance. While speaking in lecture, he emphasized on the necessity of equal representation of the southeastern region in the federal sector, which would bring both political and industrial developments in the region. According to him, there has been negligence of the eastern region, even as it has been represented by a few number of persons. While I have highlighted and firmly reproved the actions of the current federal administration, we cannot deny that we have had some opportunities in government since the return to democracy in 1999. I have taken the liberty to obtain some information about equal representation at the federal level from 1999 to the present time to enable us to reason together to save us some time here, I have attached a list of Southeast representation in the armed forces, the parliamentary agencies, including the Immigration and Intelligence Services, the Senate and the House of Representatives since Nigeria's return to democracy in 1999. In the attachment tab, Appendix 1, you will see that we have had nine Southeasterners as heads of various services within the armed forces, five Senate presidents, one deputy Senate president who is the longest ever, and one chief whip of the Senate. The Southeast has never occupied the position of Speaker of the Federal House of Representatives, but it has occupied the Deputy Speaker position for four years, while it has occupied the Deputy Leader position almost exclusively since 1999. Based on the constitutional provisions of one minister per state, every Southeast state has had representations in the Federal Cabinet since 1999. It may be useful to know that we have had 25 Southeasterners serve in various, in several capacities as ministers of the Federal Republic. Now, taken holistically, there are three perspectives to the sets of information that I just offered. It is clear from the distribution of appointments, especially in the military, that President Obasanjo, President Yaradua, and Jonathan and the PDP as a party demonstrated statesmanship and greater sensitivity to Nigeria's diversity by ensuring representation of Nigeria's various groups in the nation's governance structure. This is starkly different from what we have today. For the incoming administration, there should always be a consideration to give the nation's component groups a sense of inclusion and a sense of belonging. Going further, he criticized the representatives as they could not effectively represent the region. He therefore pointed that the representatives neglected the reasons for their positions, thereby leaving the region in a state of underdevelopment and insecurity. The second dimension from which I would like you to view this is the policy of representation that we have had from representatives in these positions. I invite you to take particular note that over an eight-year period from 1999 to 2007, the Igbo had the position of Senate President, the third highest ranking position in the country. Let us leave our emotions aside. So apart from the psychological high that an Igbo was number three or equals were number three citizens at various times, what special benefits accrue to the Southeast? Did the region get increased budgetary allocations, improved infrastructure, more appointments, and more employment opportunities? What legacy can be ascribed to eight years of representation at that level? How about the Deputy Senate President position, which an equal held for 12 years, the longest ever by any group? What's the legacy from the Southeast perspective? And for me, the essence, the point I'm trying to make, and I'm going to tie it up shortly, is that whilst we feel this sense of marginalization, we should also reflect internally what we have done for ourselves, what our representatives have done, whether they've been there for themselves or there for the people, the region, and the group that they represent. Take another look at the ministerial portfolios by all standards. 
Some of these were as devotal as they were prestigious. Again, I ask, how did we deploy these representative opportunities we had, that, that we had? We had the young, as our people say, and we had the knife, but we could not cut enough young spots. Who is to blame for this? I'd like to quote Achebe again. His 1983 book, The Trouble with Nigeria, where he said, there's nothing wrong with the Nigerian climate or air or anything else. The Nigerian problem is the inability, the unwillingness of his leaders to rise to the responsibility, to the challenge of personal example, which is the hallmark of true leadership, end of quote. And so being mindful of the intense competition for resources and the geoethnic sensitivities in Nigeria, which I alluded to earlier, does the region have the moral authority to lament neglect and marginalization if its own representatives are unable to meet its expectations? He went for that to say that the Biafra insurgency is just a tool for political propaganda, just like other insurgencies in the country. Insurgencies like Boko Haram, Niger Delta Group and others were used to politically pursue interests not minding high damages caused in the country. Biafran agitators who have in the quest for a better way of life for Ali were taken to arms, violence, and the imposition of a compulsory sit at home order every morning. I cannot tell you that your agitation is unreasonable or unfounded. My submission above has shown that there is a cause. Yet I will implore you to consider the following. One, the effects of the war that ensued from the first attempt to secede from Nigeria can only be described as a tragedy of immense proportions. It was devastating to lose almost two million lives with many unaccounted for. We had millions of young children starved to death and tens of thousands more who were uplifted out of the country and never reconnected to their roots. It was devastating to our values and way of life. It was de devastating for the progress we had begun to make in our economy and with innovative solutions. Many lost their morale for leaving every possessions and everything that signified an iota of pride as individuals. The aftermath of the war still lingers just as much as the cause shared the whole. Thus, we must be pragmatic, sensitive, and wise in ensuring that we do not incur a cost that many will repay for another lifetime. Number two, the effects of your agitation today are not felt by those who govern us, nor are they persuasive enough to make the majority see a reason to support secession. Instead, the poor are getting poorer, being battered by a government that ignores them, and the non-state actor that keep them in fear. The Southeast bleeds profusely every Monday that local businesses, schools, hospitals and institutions are closed. Our people fear outsiders as much as they fear uh, they, they, as much as they fear of their own people. This is not right. In research carried out by the International Center for Investigative Reporting, it was reported that the Southeast loses an average of 75.7 billion naira every day that a sit at home is observed. Our transportation sector alone loses 10 billion naira every day, and traders have lost in excess of 5 trillion for the past two years. We have observed a sit at home order for 71 Mondays so far. Salaries are dropping faster as, employ as employers no longer make satisfactory sales. Out-of-state buyers have also turned to alternatives as the fear of getting caught in a violent situation keeps them away from the southeast. So if the aim is to keep people hungry enough to get them agitated, you may also consider that they will eventually see you as the enemy. Finally, what is the quality of leadership that will take over the reins of administration should a referendum be granted and the new entity demanded with intense passion become a reality? Will it be one raised on violence and threats 
as those are tools you are breaking now, will it be one where your governors and representatives across the world do not care to hold their promises to you? Is there a strain of deception and manipulation in those who want you to believe that the North and the West are fully responsible for our problems? In the mind, I implore you to reconsider the motives and the strength of your pursuit. I speak to you as one that is unhappy with the current system and want to see it change. That we sit down and reevaluate our methods, our goals, and our values. I said earlier that I have never felt more evil than I do today, but I still believe in the entity called Nigeria, crooked as it may be now. And as Chino Ajabe noted, in the trouble with Nigeria, all we need is the right leadership, and the South East will be on the path to glory again. I base my firm belief on our history and the success we recorded when we had visionary and selfish leaders. Therefore, our attention must be on instituting a leadership structure that can be trusted and held accountable to deliver the dividends of democracy to our region. On this note, I will return to the question of the Nigerian president from the Southeast. If it becomes a reality in 2023, the quest for a Nigerian president from the Southeast will be a dream come true for many of us. It will break the deepening sense of alienation and begin to restate a sense of belonging. As Faru Peron deeply captured in his April 2022 article titled why Nigeria needs to elect a new president in 2023. He therefore advocates for good leadership structure and active participation by the Easterners, as it will be a dream come true for them if an Igbo man becomes Nigeria's next president, who will walk in the footsteps of Michael Parra of the 20th century. We've come to the end of today's broadcast on My School News TV. I am one of the success. Until next time, subscribe, follow, and like My School News TV on all social media platforms at My School News TV.